Mr. Isaac, Mr. Bright, and Mr. Paul, here we Thank you very much again for yesterday. Um, it's very, very good. Nice but we did one for one for Thanks very much for watching that. Okay, you got more time than usual. 13 minutes this week.
wait in line at the BMV. I will wait for the right moment. I will wait for the fire to grow. I will wait for the last dance. I will wait for the light to turn green. I will wait for the kids to come home. I will wait for the paint to dry. I will wait for the right words to say. I will wait for Christmas to arrive. I will wait for a lot of things, but I will not wait for an opportunity to share love. The world needs love. We need love. So today we light the candle of love to remind us to spread love wherever we go. May we be courageous enough to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. We are seeking a place to belong, the feeling that God is here in this room. We are seeking joy that overflows, the movement of the spirit, a hand to hold when alone in the dark. We are seeking the freedom to be, the courage to love, the conviction to act in the face of injustice. We are seeking, but here in this space, we are found. Take a deep breath. This is your sanctuary. God is here. We are found. Amen.
greatest gifts and challenges of faith is that we cannot be Christian alone. We need one another. We need one another to grow. We need one another to love. And we need one another to see God more clearly. So together, let us lift our voices in unison. Let us lean into the ties that bind and pray to our merciful God. God of today and tomorrow, when Mary was pregnant and afraid, she ran to her cousin Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth threw open the door with joy and sure place and stomp on her. How often do we have the same opportunity? How often do we leave the door locked, the curtains drawn, and the lights off? How often do we shower critique or judgment instead of blessings and joy? Gracious God, forgive us for our wrongs. We want to see you when we see you. Friends, this is what we know. God delights in us. God throws open the door, just like Elizabeth, and says, come on home. There is room for you here. And in that moment, we are blessed. In that moment, we are forgiven. In that moment, we are seen, healed, and welcomed home. Rest in this good news. You are saved by grace. Let us respond together using the words from Mary's song, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. Remain standing for just a moment and turn around and say good morning to someone nearby. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Welcome to everyone online. We invite you to comment in the chat and let us know that you're with us virtually. You may be seated. My name is Jerusha Van Camp and I am the parish visitor here at First Presbyterian Church. We invite you to fill out the yellow slip that you'll find in front of you in the pew. That allows us to give thanks to God for your presence. If you have a prayer request or a prayer concern, you can write that on the orange slip in your pew and also put that in the offering plate along with the yellow slip when the offering goes by. Well, if you haven't found your name tag, I know there's a few that are still missing, um, please let us know. That's a great thing you can write on your yellow slip if you didn't find one. Um, if you're a visitor, we're happy to make one for you as well. The name tags are in the hallway here coming into the sanctuary or the fellowship hall. So if you haven't found yours yet, please go and look for it. It's a great way to offer hospitality and be able to call each other by first name. Another way to help us with hospitality here at First Pres is to make sure that we have a current photo of you and hopefully a photo of your family in our safe first web uh, online directory. Uh, Carrie Aiken and I will be in the lobby after worship today, so if you don't have a recent picture or um, don't have one at all, we really would love to get that in First Web. This will help Reverend Anna Von Winkler when she joins us in January be able to put faces to names and see who belongs to who here in the church. And in the spirit of that, I would like some audience participation. I brought my cell phone and I would like to take a photograph of you waving and we're going to print some photos out and, and for uh, Reverend Von Winkler. So bear with me, let me get my camera up here. And everybody smile and wave. And we will use these to welcome Reverend Anna when she comes in January. 
Merry and Bright doesn't describe everyone's mood during the holidays, and here at First Pres, we have especially been saddened with all of the losses we've experienced in this congregation. So we invite you to join us on Wednesday night for the longest night service. It's at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary. We will also be live streaming it. It'll be an opportunity to find comfort in Christ's peace through music, scripture readings, and prayer. It really is a beautiful service and one that I have found a lot of comfort in myself over the past few years. I hope that you can join us. It's hard to believe that this weekend is Christmas. And on Christmas Eve, we will host our annual Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m. It's always such a beautiful service with carols and candles and communion, and I hope that you'll join us. No reservations are needed, and there will be child care. So I hope that will encourage all of you to come, bring your family, and worship together on Christmas Eve. Next Sunday and the Sunday following, being that Christmas is on Christmas was on Sunday and New Year's Day is on Sunday. We will only be having one service at 1030. Um, so come dress comfy, wear your ugly Christmas sweater. Pajamas are not even, uh, wouldn't, also wouldn't be a bad idea. You can do that. But we won't judge you if you stay home in your pajamas. But please join us online for worship next Sunday and the Sunday after at 1030. Check your bulletin for other announcements. And we're really glad that you're here both in person and online. Let's continue our worship of God. Let us pray. God of all, we are often distracted and forlorn, eager and anxious. Break down the barriers we place around our hearts and douse us in good news. We need to know that we are not alone and that you are always near. Knock on our door, then come right in. Make yourself at home. Pull us close and tell us your story of unbelievable good news. We are listening. We are grateful. Amen. Today's lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures comes from the seventh chapter of the book of Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary, to weary mortals that you may weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Would the children of the church please come forward? You can come on up here, yeah. Or you can sit over there. That worked. That's okay. That's okay. Here we go. Hi. I'm going to read you a story today, okay? It's called The Invisible String. Maybe you've heard of it before. No? Liza and Jeremy, the twins, were asleep one calm and quiet night. Suddenly it began to rain very hard. Thunder rumbled until it got so loud that it woke them up. Mommy, mommy, they cried as they ran to her. Don't worry, you two. It's just the storm making all that noise. Go back to bed. <clears throat> we want to stay close to you, said Jeremy. We're scared. Mom said, you know we're always together no matter what. But how can we be together when you're out here and we're in bed, said Liza. Mom held something right in front of them and said, this is how. This is how. You don't see anything? It's invisible string, that's right. Rubbing their sleepy eyes, the twins came closer to see what mom was holding. I was about your age when my mommy first told me about the invisible string. I don't see a string, said Jeremy. You don't need to see the invisible string. People who love each other are always connected by a very special string made of love. But if you can't see it, how do you know it's there, asked Liza. Even though you can't see it with your eyes, you can feel it with your heart. And you know that you are always connected to everyone you love. When you're at school and you miss me, your love travels all the way along the string until I feel it tug at my heart. And when you tug it right back, we feel it in our hearts, said Jeremy. Does Jasper the cat have an invisible string, Liza asked. She sure does, said Mom. And best friends like me and Lucy, asked Liza. Best friends, too. How far can the string reach? Anywhere and everywhere, Mom said. Would it reach me even if I was a submarine captain deep in the ocean, asked Jeremy? Yes, Mom said, even there. Or a mountain climber? Even there. A ballerina in France? Even there. A jungle explorer? Even there. How about an astronaut out in space? Yes, even there. Then Jeremy quietly asked, can my string reach all the way to Uncle Brian in heaven? Yes, even there. Does the string go away when you're mad at us? Never, said Mom. Love is stronger than anger. And as long as love is in your heart, the string will always be there. Even when you get older and can't agree about things like what movie to see or what game to play in the back seat. Or what time to go to bed? Oh, that's right, you two should be in bed. And with that, they all laughed as mom chased the twins back to their bed. Within a few minutes, they were asleep, even though the storm was still making the same loud noises outside. As they slept, they started dreaming of all the invisible strings they have and all the strings their friends have and their friends have, and their friends have, until everyone in the world was connected by invisible strings. And from deep inside, they now could clearly see no one is ever alone. And Pastor John and I are going to be leaving in just a few weeks. But there's a new pastor, Pastor Anna, who is going to come. And I have so enjoyed my time with you. 
and getting to know you a little bit. And I, so we have strings between us that connect us, and those strings will always be there. And when Pastor Anna comes, she'll form new strings with you, so you'll have a new string with Pastor Anna. Won't that be nice? Yeah. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the strings of love that connect us to all the people who love us and care about us and that we love and care about. Thank you most of all for your son Jesus and for your love for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, you can go over. You want to go to your classroom? Okay, and head on over there. Today's gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, beginning with verse 39. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and was greeted by Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Before John and I were approached by Susan McGee to be bridge co-pastors here in Evansville, we were being trained to be part of a team at First Presbyterian Church in Bloomington to assist immigrants who were are, were, and are arriving from different countries. Families with children of all ages were and are arriving at the Indianapolis airport, often with nothing but the clothes on their backs. The team works with an organization to find an apartment, obtain necessary legal papers, and to begin looking for employment for those who need to work. When we receive word that a family is arriving, part of the team begins outfitting the apartment with the appropriate number of beds, the basic furniture they will need. Others gather linens, dishes, pots and pans, silverware, toilet paper, soap, toothbrushes, cleaning supplies, and other necessities of daily living. And they collect a few toys for the children as well. Members of the team greet the family at the airport and then transport them to Bloomington to the apartment that will become their home. The team also assists in getting children enrolled in school, obtaining clothes for the family, working through the legal system, taking the family for groceries and teaching them how to use the rural transit systems arranging for medical care, getting an interpreter if needed, and connecting them to a faith community if that's something that they want. Most arrive without any baggage at all or personal items because they have escaped violence and needed to leave their homes very quickly. Some teams remain connected with the family for just a few weeks while others stay connected for several months, depending on what the needs of that particular family are. The goal is to welcome the family, to get them set up with a place to live, 
connected to resources, enroll children in school, find employment, and help them to become self-sufficient in this new community and in this new country. Christine Hong, whose own parents were Korean immigrants, tells that her mother told her, whoever you meet at the airport determines the direction of your life determines the direction your life will move. She writes, I remember my mother's words and reflect on them whenever I reach significant impasses in my life, a new job, a move, or when I became a parent for the first time. Each significant milestone feels like a threshold. When I prepare to cross those thresholds, I look for the people and communities waiting on the other side. The people and the communities that will anchor me, hold me in the nebulous spaces of change, uncertainty, and even fear. We read today, Mary entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. The Greek word for house means the structure and the building, but it also encompasses the relationships of the family that is the basis for that structure and where they find themselves, like the house of Windsor or the house of David. Mary entered Elizabeth's house in a Judean town in the hill country. It was probably made of stone, a little house built on top of and among a lot of other little houses with small courtyards and steep, narrow alleyways winding among them. It probably had a central room with a hive-shaped oven where pruned olive branches were burned and fragrant. A pile of dried dung was there for the cooking fire. The rooms were dark and small with high windows for ventilation. A big jug of water stood by the door that someone filled early in the morning to be used carefully all day long, nothing wasted. But it wasn't the house that Mary sought that day. Somehow she knew or she hoped that this is the place where she would be welcomed. Every Sunday, people walk through the doors of a church, this church, because they hope they will be welcomed. We who have been around the church a long time know that we're here to welcome others. But sometimes we get so busy enjoying and welcoming the ones we know, the familiar faces, those we call friends, that we forget to welcome the ones we don't know, who aren't familiar. It takes initiative and intent to seek these people out and to bring them in. A newly retired pastor talked about using his Sunday freedom from preaching responsibilities to visit churches in the area and he and his wife visited over 15 churches. They knew how to dress and act in a church, but in church after church after church, almost everyone ignored them. There was no welcome. I can't help but wonder, what if they had looked differently? than those they were visiting. How would they have been received? Mary was in need. People just don't walk up to a place of hospitality or travel a distance, especially by foot, to get to a place for no reason at all. They go because they need something. We don't know 
for sure what Mary's need was. We know that she had a life-changing encounter with an angel. We can imagine she was perplexed, overwhelmed, frightened, anxious, lonely, maybe hopeful that she would find some welcome there. Quite frankly, I imagine I would feel a little bit of all these things if I had encountered the mystery of God. We do know that it causes her to hurry to this house in the Judean town in the hill country. The word house also means to spend the night, to go in, to find safety from dangers of the dark. It would not be too much of a stretch to assume that Mary needed shelter that a friend could give, that she needed blessing that family can offer. There is an Irish proverb that says, it is, the shelter of each, it is in the shelter of each other that the people live. It is in the shelter of each other that the people live. To make a place hospitable, we must first make room in our own hearts. It is the practice day by day by day of love and generosity that makes our hearts spacious enough to be welcoming. This is not about entertaining someone. This is hospitality, the work, the joy of God. Wise woman Benedictine Joan Chittister says, hospitality is the first step toward dismantling the barriers of the world. It is the way we turn a prejudiced world around, one heart at a time. Hospitality binds the world together. Now, Elizabeth could have been judgmental. Mary was engaged, but not yet married. And she was pregnant. Societal norms would have had her go someplace away where people didn't know her to wait for the baby, and then she would probably have been shunned or kept in seclusion. Instead, Mary is met by a cousin who greets her with welcome, anticipation, and a powerful blessing. So rich was the blessing that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped up to greet Mary and the baby in Mary's womb. Any fear Mary had was met with the courageous courage of Elizabeth, courage enough for both of them. And through their spiritual and relational partnership, Mary and Elizabeth framed the path of partnership for their children as well. Mary greets Elizabeth at a literal threshold, the doorway of Elizabeth's home, and goes to her at a threshold moment in her life when all is about to change. We all face threshold moments in our lives. When we begin that first day of school, when we move from elementary school to middle school, and then again from middle school to high school, when we graduate and head for college or a training program or into the workforce, we cross still another threshold. Then there are breakups in our lives, a move to a new town, the potential for marriage, possible children, changes of employment, divorce, and deaths. These are all threshold moments. A large part of growing up is learning how to manage and cope with the feelings involved in these changes and challenges in life. 
Even the exciting thresholds have elements of anxiety and stress because they involve something new and different. Recall a threshold moment in your own life. Who were the people who greeted you, who supported you, or gave you comfort? I have heard time and time again from people, I don't like change. The reality is that most people don't like change. There is comfort in the familiar, the usual, the traditional, the known. There is a part of being human that wants to know the future, whether it's the weather we're talking about, the stock market, which cars are the most reliable, how elections will turn out, or what the end of the story is. We want to know what we can count on. The reality is we can count on things changing. Yet change, as we know, is inevitable. We experience the changing of seasons and I believe we're able to find beauty and blessing in each one. Naturally, we may all have our preferences depending on whether we like to garden or we like to build snowmen and make snow angels. Thomas Long of Candler University wrote in the Advent devotional, A Surprising God, our motives reflect a deep hunger to protect ourselves from the unknown, to exert ultimate control over life, to eliminate all unpredictability and surprise. Yet he continues, those who are familiar with scripture will recognize that yearning for a future free of surprises is down deep actually a desire to be free of God. If our predicting the future is really only a projection of what we already know and who we already are, then we are imagining a future inhabited only by our powers and desires, one that humans can dominate and control. But the living God seen in the Bible is a God full of surprises. One who since Eden has frustrated all human efforts to eliminate predictability. God says, do not remember the former things. I am about to do a new thing. Who would have expected a burning bush? or the parting of the Red Sea. This surprising heart, God is at the heart of Advent. God didn't come to us as a mighty warrior or a powerful king, one who the people of that time were expecting. God came as a tiny, vulnerable little baby in a lowly stable whose birth was announced to shepherds in a sky filled with angels. God keeps adventing into our lives in ways that continue to amaze us. God is the only one we can count on amidst all the changes we encounter in our lives, all the thresholds we cross. God's love remains steadfast throughout the ages. We saw that as we celebrated the 200th anniversary of this church. And God, by way of the Holy Spirit, will give us the strength, the courage, the comfort, and the assurance to walk through all the thresholds of our lives. When faced with a threshold, we can look for those who will offer us hospitality, welcome, and the blessing we need. 
and we can draw strength and comfort from our God who is our rock and promises never to forsake us. This congregation is facing yet another threshold, the arrival and ministry of Reverend Anna von Winkler. God has led her here to you at this time, your new threshold. You have seen God's faithfulness in providing all that you have needed to this point. May you welcome and embrace her with all the warmth and joy and love of our sister Elizabeth. Amen. other. This we believe. Amen. We will receive the Christmas Joy offering today, supporting current and retired church workers in need as well as Presbyterian schools and colleges. You may use the envelope in your bulletin to contribute. Elizabeth offers her home. She offers her arms. She offers her joy. She offers her affirmation and confidence. Elizabeth offers everything she has when Mary shows up at her door, and it is holy. 
Part of our call as people of faith is to give when and where we can. Today, we are invited to be a little more like Elizabeth. Today, we are invited to give generously, trusting that God will take these gifts and build a better world. Let us give with joyful hearts.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, thank you for the generous way you love us. May these gifts, along with the gift of our very selves, bring healing and comfort to your world. Amen. We share our joys and concerns at this time before um, our prayers of the people. First of all, um, let us remember those who have joined the church triumphant, uh, Bob Hurt, Lou Young, Warren Brown, Mary Marie Wynn, Carl Swaim Jr., and Janet Robinson. May their memory be a blessing. We lift up to God this week and for your consideration, Suzanne Kohlmeyer recovering from shingles, the lonely and those away from family during this time, the Evansville community, people struggling with bills and worried about next meals and other dilemmas. Prayers to, uh, f prayers to, prayers for healthcare workers caring for uh, children and adults during this um, triple demic. Interesting word, triple demic. Thanksgiving for the life of Bev Lacey, who died earlier this month, and comfort for her family. For Walt and Judy, Walt was admitted uh, to memory care facility recently. Judy is dealing with a pinched nerve and is in great pain. Uh, Lisa Colvert's mother, who is in the hospital right now. For uh, Mary and Lisa, who, is, uh, who are being treated for cancer and for their families. For Leslie and all those uh, struggling with mental health issues. For all uh, struggling with dementia and those who care for them. For Martha Boast, who has been ill for Be Becky Sparks Thyssen and Lynn and their family after the sudden death of Michael. Prayers for Karen Daniels as she recovers from heart surgery and I learned that she's doing very well off the ventilator and is doing great. For all who are grieving this holiday season, for our friends and members who, are, who live alone and in residential facilities, all these we lift to the Lord. Let us pray. God of yesterday and God of tomorrow, from the very beginning you gave us the gift of relationships. You tucked us into communities. You, you wired us for connection. You made our hearts capable of love. For all of this, we thank you. This gift of a relationship has led us to people who lead us to you, and we are better for it. So today we want to say thank you for our Elizabeths, for the people who have, been, who have thrown open their doors for us, who revel in our joy, who, who point out your presence in our lives, who are quick to affirm us and call us blessed. Those people come in many shapes and sizes, for some of us, the Elizabeths in our lives are family members, brothers, sisters, parents and grandparents who have cheered us along the way. For others, teachers and counselors, neighbors and church members, closest friends, confidants come to mind. And we can't forget the way our chosen family, spouses and partners and even our own children have been like Elizabeths for us. These people have reminded us that what love looks like in a hurting world, which has pointed us back to you. So today, God, we ask for your help in opening our eyes even more. We want to see you in those who love us well and those who are reluctant. We want to see you in those we see every day and in those 
we're never, we've never talked to. We want to see you not only in those who are family, who look like us or think like us, but in those who come from, every, from very different places and positions in life. From generation to generation, you have left your fingerprints over all creation. Help us to be like, be like Elizabeth, to see you and celebrate glimmers of your good news in all that we see and do in the world. With hope we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. of God, do not be afraid. Listen to the word of the Lord who promises to be with us in every age. Spread the word to those who live without hope. Live the word as people who know God with us. Emmanuel. Now may the face of God shine upon you to bless you that you may be a blessing to others. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>